Dan Turchin, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I'm thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. Mahan, such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Dan, I am so excited because soon after I saw the tsunami that I believe a lot of professionals and organizations will face as a result of AI, I looked for resources and one of the first ones I came across was your brilliant podcast, AI and the Future of Work. I have binge listened to it, recommend to all of my listeners to do the same thing in understanding AI's impact on the future of work. So can't wait to get some of your thoughts and perspectives on that, as well as the fact that you're CEO of People Rain, which is an AI company. But would love to know, Dan, whereabouts you grew up and how your upbringing impacted the kind of person you've become. Han, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, introduce myself to your listeners. I've become a fan of your podcast as well. And AI and the Future of Work, as you mentioned, uh, we've, we've now published uh, over 175 episodes. And like you in this podcast, it's my passion project. And we were talking offline about uh, what an honor it is you know, for us to be able to host some amazing guests and share these important conversations with the community. In terms of my background, I was born in New Jersey, grew up in San Diego. Uh, my dad was very much a working class hero. And uh, he was a pioneer in the field of recycling. Worked outdoors his whole life till his uh, hands were dry and bleeding, picking up uh, aluminum cans and scrap metal and, uh, and hauling it around in a truck. Oh, wow. And uh, one, one formative day, he decided he had, uh, he had lived through one too many New Jersey winters and looked at the map and said, I bet, I bet it's better to be a junk man in California. And so uh, I grew up in San Diego. I moved to the Bay Area for school uh, in the 90s and uh, never looked back. The, the, there's something special about the Bay Area. Nothing to do with the tech economy, more to do with the physical environment and how open-minded a culture it is. I love being in a place where I'm, I'm proud to say that my kids' schools look like the United Nations. Every language, every style of dress, every background, every every value system is celebrated. And so the combination of that open-mindedness and being surrounded by the mountains and the ocean and an amazing city like San Francisco to the north of us, uh, I think it's a special place to raise kids. And I'd say I'm very much a product of, of my environment, but I also chose the lifestyle and the, um, and, you know, the, the culture of Silicon Valley because it reflects uh, my own and my family's value system. And that says a lot about who I am and, and what's led to me. And uh, I've now started seven companies, most recent being People Rain. But a lot of my philosophy goes into everything we do at People Rain and everything that has gone into the other companies I've started in the past. And that philosophy that you talk about, Dan, is really important and comes across your values due in the conversations that you have. And I appreciate you mentioning the ecosystem that the Bay Area has. It's interesting because a lot of different communities have tried to duplicate that ecosystem, but ecosystems are not that easy to duplicate. It will be interesting. So I'm curious uh, with respect to your thoughts, with more companies doing more hybrid work and some deciding to go fully remote, do you think that ecosystem will be as important a part of a physical geography that companies uh, are present in or the importance of it will go down? So this is a common topic on, on my podcast. I recently had two amazing guests who both are from Scandinavia, uh, Otto Sutherland from uh, CEO of a company called Speechly doing amazing work in uh, NLU and NLP and a gentleman named Michael Osterreder who is using generative AI for uh, to synthetically generate stock images. And I asked them a similar question. What is it like to build a tech first company an AI first tech first company outside of a traditional tech hub? And their thinking and their philosophy around how they're building their organization shaped my thinking as well. And it's, it's uh, led to something I say frequently, it's almost become a cliche, but, at People Rain, we no longer hire 
the best zip code, we hire the best talent. And I firmly believe that the workplace of the future is this fluid, flexible, what I'll call a work net instead of a workforce. And the work net consists of people who are passionate about performing a specific job or a task or uh, it, it's not necessarily a title on a business card and it's not a seat in a cube in an office. It's about doing your best work and that can be done from anywhere and surrounding yourself with people who share the passion for doing their best work along with you. I think that the most productive organizations and the organization of the future will consist of everybody doing the best work of their lives, extracting all the friction out of traditional work, more the stuff that you don't like, dealing with HR, being treated like a ticket, commuting, things that just don't necessarily need to be a part of the fabric of work. And I think if you extract all of that from the drudgery, then work no longer becomes a four-letter word. And we're working with people we love working with who are passionate like we are. To me, that's the way to improve productivity. And that's how we all become better humans. It is interesting as we are transitioning to that, Dan. Uh, Peter Drucker was talking about this. And I remember even back in the 90s, uh, Tom Peters was mentioning how the future of work, in his view, would resemble more uh, what he saw as uh, movies where people came together on specific projects. You have one best director for that specific project and that director would pull together people who would be the right people for set design for that movie so on and so forth they work on that project and then disband so if that is sort of the future of work as you also see it what does that require with respect to the way companies think of themselves and what does it require with respect to how professionals manage their own careers in that world? Very important topic. First requires us to reimagine the education system. I think both of us have uh, have daughters, and I have two daughters, one ninth grader and one a seventh grader. I believe yours are similar. Yes, ages. Tenth, tenth and seventh, exactly. There you go. So the traditional educational system does a disservice to emerging leaders because it teaches us that the the label on the diploma hanging on the wall defines who we are and it doesn't define who we are far from it the skills that i want my girls to be investing in are the skills that are required to be leaders in the future workplace and that's no longer necessarily aligned with the skills that you get out of a textbook i believe that to be the best human and to be a leader in the next decade plus means investing in skills that can't be replicated by machines. I believe that will coexist with machines, but the best of humans combined with the best of machines is the future that I want to create and invent and invest in. And that requires graduating students and encouraging them to invest in skills like empathy and rational thinking being good humans who are able to teach and lead and coach. These are things that bots, chat GPT will never be great at. As you demonstrated with uh, in your great episode about chat GPT, it can credibly, I think this was your daughter's idea, I believe, it can credibly write uh, a play about volleyball in the, in, the, in the style of Shakespeare. And it's great at that. But you know what? It was your daughter who had the idea. To do that and and what do you do with that content once chat gpt produces it how can you take the output of these tech text prompts where you know maybe we will use some automation to come up with cute parlor tricks but it's always going to be up to humans to really figure out how to make each other better and how and when and where to leverage technology to invest in our humanness that's a beautiful way of putting it dan and it's a positive, inspiring way of putting it as well, because a lot of people that I've conversations with who have played around, whether it's with ChatGPT or some who are familiar with some other aspects of AI are terrified. But what you're saying is that humanity 
that uh, Gary Bolas talks about this on the future of work. Ed Hess uh, talks about it also. That humanity, that empathy, those are things we need to leverage. Unfortunately, as you mentioned, the school system is not best at getting people to do that. It's best at getting them to jump through hoops. And as you heard in that conversation, I get frustrated when my daughters are asked, so what do you want to do for a profession? I understand the intention behind the question that the school system wants to uh, generate conversation. But a lot of times they feel like they need to learn the specific skills now for that end rather than the humanity that is so important in this age of AI. Now, you also, after getting your degree in industrial engineering at uh, Stanford, as you said, you have uh, started several companies. Back in 2019, you started your podcast, uh, AI and the Future of Work. And then February 2020, right before the pandemic, Dan, you started your current company, People Rain. How did you get involved in AI in the first place? And then what got you to start People Rain? Take you in the Wayback Machine. <laughs> Back in the 90s, my passion was about how people inter interact with technology and how civilizations get built up around big, bold ideas and how technology can be used to accelerate progress. And I was back when I was in an undergrad, I was studying Luddism, the movement in the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, primarily in, in, uh, in Britain, the machine breakers. And it, I was just intrigued by these waves of technology where we, we, we tend to not want to be on the wrong side of innovation. Innovation usually wins, and yet innovation can be a threat. And we often, just as a species, fear the other, and oftentimes technology is the other. So I started work at Disney as an industrial engineer using my training and was just, just smitten by the culture and by you know, what it means to uh, delight you know, so much of the world with a strong brand. I was so proud. Every day I, I pinched myself. I couldn't believe they paid me to do that work. <laughs> and uh, I got a fateful call from a friend of mine from undergrad who was starting a company. And uh, he said, would you mind helping me out for a weekend? I want, I want a, a review on this business plan that I'm writing. Uh, I left Orlando where I was at the time and uh, I never went back. I, I, the, the, the bug bit hard. And as much as I could have been a Disney lifer, I helped launch a company called Search Button, which was a very early, uh, now we call it a SaaS company, but uh, hosted site search. And that led to the first company I started called Aeroprise. And what Aeroprise was doing was what we now call AI. But back in the day, in the 90s, we called it a self-learning personalization engine. And the the problem that we set out to solve was a problem that I lived when I was at Disney. And that was every time I or you know any one of 350,000 Disney employees had any kind of a technology request, it required a lot of effort and a, a lot of uh, unnecessary delays because uh, the technician would have to print out a paper ticket describing my or someone else's problem and hoof it over to someone's desk in a you know in a cube in an office and they would almost always not get credit for having fixed the problem in time because they'd have a service level agreement in SLA and so they would get dinged and you know feel like they were never doing a good job and it was because they couldn't really get credit for the work they were doing in the field and so we said what if you could condense a big trouble ticket application a client server system at the time into essentially uh, a small enough amount of content that it could fit on a pager, then the pager could actually become a computing device because there were no smartphones, there were no Blackberries. And so what we did is we decided if you could figure out based on the context of the work, what components of the trouble ticket needed to go on the pager, then maybe you could actually write a little lightweight app to the firmware on the pager, push out the trouble ticket information and just like magic, the, the tech would have a better life, they'd be more productive, the users would have less downtime. And that's really the way technology should work for people as opposed to people having to work for technology. Well, fast forward, 
that idea carried me through the next several companies, this idea of making life better for employees in large organizations interacting with technology. But the itch I never got to scratch until a couple of years ago was the ability to really use what we now call AI to do this at scale. So along came neural nets uh, five to seven years ago, really popularized by Jeff Hinton and a number of other real pioneers in the space. And all of a sudden, we could do things like what we now know chat GPT could do. We well, can essentially think of people rain, which as you mentioned, we started in interestingly, February of 2020 <laughs> as being chat GPT for the employee. So what if as an employee, you had essentially a digital concierge that follows you around and understands who you are and what you need, and even anticipates the kinds of questions you might have. And if you could proactively deliver this concierge-like service to the employee, all of a sudden you give them back probably an hour a week to be better employees, but also, you know what, better spouses, because it means in that hour a week, you're getting to your, your kid's soccer game, or you know, you're getting to the piano recital. And all of a sudden, in that hour and a week that you get back, you're a better friend and a spouse, and you can pursue a hobby. And so the vision behind People Rain. Again, the seventh company, you know, it's all been kind of an evolution to, to people reign, but it is, uh, as our name implies, I firmly believe that technology is an enabler. It's a facilitator. It's very powerful. But even in a world where there's a chat GPT, people reign. So that's uh, v- very much a part of every, every line of code we write. Every day we get up and think about how we can make people better by using technology. That's a that's a great perspective to have. And additionally, Dan, I wanted to underline the fact that a lot of times people uh, view uh, entrepreneurs like you as technologists. It's that you saw a business issue, problem, a friction point. It's not the fascination with the technology that got you to start the company. It's you saw a business problem. And that's what you were looking to address with those initial forms of AI. And now fast forward, as the AI has improved, your ability to solve those problems for the companies has improved. So your virtual agent, intelligent virtual agent, is specifically an agent for IT and HR um, employee service, which, by the way, I love. The fact that you focus adds a lot of value, I'm sure, in the functionality of the agent. What are the types of companies, size organizations that use this? I imagine it can be across industries because all companies have a functional HR and IT. But what are the size organizations that use an agent like yours to make the lives of their employees better? People Brain is the best fit for large organizations that span geographies where many different languages are spoken. There are many different time zones that are supported. And oftentimes employees who aren't in or around headquarters feel like second class citizens. So one of the key attributes of our virtual agent is it speaks 27 languages. Obviously, by the nature of it being a virtual agent, it spans 24 time zones. It's always available. It gets smarter with every question it's asked. And the way we got started is we trained a neural net on about a billion historical trouble tickets and HR cases. So it's kind of what would happen if you took all of the accumulated knowledge in every caseworker and IT technician's head around the planet, translated into 27 languages and exposed that as a service to every large organization. That's people reign. And so it's the best fit where there are complex processes, high volumes of calls, where these patterns are really hard to disseminate across large numbers of employees trying to support end users. So the more complex, the higher volume, the more time zones, those tend to be the organizations that are the best fit for people reign. So as you run this uh, organization, Dan, you are also a student of AI and its impact uh, on organizations and uh, society. So I want to get some of your thoughts and perspectives. 
first of all, there is a lot of conversation around artificial general intelligence versus artificial na narrow intelligence. I want to see if the so-called Turing test uh, is even relevant anymore, anymore. So for the audience, Turing test is, uh, what I understand, is you would have a conversation and wouldn't be able to detect whether it's a human or it's a chatbot, or it's AI. First of all, is it relevant or not? And what is the difference between artificial narrow intelligence if it's implemented in organizations. So I, I want to see if this is like a semantic conversations, conversation that AI people are having, or is it relevant that it's narrow intelligence versus general intelligence? Well, as you implied, the Turing test is a test to see whether or not a machine can trick a human into thinking that it's human. So now I have an opinion about it and it probably comes through in the way I describe it, but I don't think Alan Turing ever intended or ever really thought through the ethical implications of confusing a human, like what's required to pass the Turing test. So when we talk about AGI, artificial general intelligence, we talk about a machine being able to replicate any task traditionally res reserved for a human. The state of AI today is where we can get to ANI, artificial narrow intelligence, very effectively. And a lot of the best applications of AI factory floor automation or robotic prosthetics for uh, amputees, uh, things that uh, reduce the incidence of seizures in patients, uh, accelerated tools for adaptive learning for kids in schools with learning impediments, uh, auto, auto translating documents for, uh, for, for people who are you know, underprivileged in third world countries, uh, detecting mines in minefields, things that you'd never want a human to do. These are all amazing applications of artificial narrow intelligence where you can train an AI model with very specific data to do a very specific task that would otherwise be done by a human. We often talk about tasks that are dull, dirty, and dangerous, being good, uh, good candidates for A and I. I don't think, I think we should stop thinking about AGI as some kind of uh, uh, milestone or, or, or you know, the, the, the pinnacle of AI. I think we should more think about it in terms of, like you referenced, problems that we have as a society in ways that technology, AI or otherwise, AI is just a tool, it's just a technology, but we should look for the ways we can make human life better. And oftentimes it's going to be good applications of artificial narrow intelligence, which our current technology is very appropriate to support, even though, depending on who you talk to, most experts would say artificial general intelligence is 30 to 50 years off. Well, you know what? That's good. I hope it never gets here. Because in the meantime, that's 30 to 50 years that we can spend solving the real hard problems that AI, I think, is best suited to, to solve. Yeah, and the way I uh, think about it, Dan, is that uh, uh, right now... It's been a few years. AI can play chess better than a human can. Well, if the uh, need that you have is chess playing and that AI does a great job of playing chess, there is no need for that specific AI to be able to do other things. So there is this desire sometimes in the AI conversations for people to want to see when will AI become more capable than a human being. A human being can play chess and play checkers and walk and do these things. That, again, to me, almost becomes an argument of how many angels can dance in the uh, head of a pin. Okay, interesting. However, there are really powerful applications with general, with artificial narrow intelligence. And we need to focus on that as you said, as a tool that can help us as humans live be better lives. I encourage my team and my guests and my listeners to always ask one important question when thinking about AI, and that is what could go wrong? We tend to get so enamored with what can go right that we often don't think about the potential adverse impact on humans if automated decisions 
are incorrect. And some examples that I think are important for us to acknowledge and be aware of as we start to do more with generative AI technologies and other AI related technologies are things like facial recognition and the ability to institutionalize the racial bias embedded in the data that we use to train AI. Well, you know what, what could go wrong? A lot could go wrong. If we use AI to mass produce or mass recreate or mass proliferate the biases that are inherent in society, that's not using technology to make the world better. And similarly, if we use AI to decide who can get incarcerated or who gets a job or who gets an interview, who gets a loan from the bank, these are things where we have to realize that all of the training data has bias encoded in it. And I had a fascinating guest on the podcast a few weeks ago. Her name is Merva Hickok. And she uh, started the site called AIethicist.org. And I'd encourage your listeners and all my listeners who haven't heard it, listen to Merva. We talked a lot about the AI Bill of Rights, the proposal from the, uh, from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. But it's a really important discussion that, that uh, kind of frames what happens when we don't ask what could go wrong. And in, in my kind of the, the framework that I have for what I call responsible AI is AI must be transparent, predictable, and configurable. Transparent in the sense that if AI was used to make a decision that impacts your life, you should know about it. And it's really important as we do more with ChatGPT that there needs to be a label slapped on anything that's generated by ChatGPT. That's where it came from. Predictable, the same inputs should generate the same outputs reliable. So some people call that explainable. No black boxes. As we're using AI-based systems to make really critical decisions, it's important that, they're, that the integrity of those algorithms is maintained. And then they should be configurable. If we decide that you know some information from our past that was incorrect was used to make a loan decision on our behalf, we should be able to correct that information, configure the algorithms, upweight, downweight, so that the automated decision making can be improved over time. I think you know as a as a global society, I hope that we embrace some kind of a an ethical framework that has us all agree on on a on a standard set of decisions and a standard way to think about what it means to practice AI responsibly. So Dan, first of all, I love that episode and I do encourage my listeners to uh, listen to it. But that brings about the question around potential public policy in that uh, with social media, it evolves so fast and there's so much positive with social media, but there were also negative aspects of it. It evolved so fast that there have been very little restrictions placed on it. And uh, it's embarrassing to reflect on the fact that even a year ago, when uh, uh, some of the representatives were talking to, um, whether it was, uh, 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 who was it from uh, Facebook? They were talking to Zuckerberg. uh, And and they had no clue whether in conversations with Zuckerberg or uh, uh, executives from Apple on how even the basic functioning of the technology works. They didn't know how Facebook makes money. Uh, so we've got, I'm in Washington, D.C. We've got incredible public servants, a lot of great people and a lot of great representatives. Many of them are clueless about technology. So how are we to have the kind of conversations that are important to make sure there are the controls that you talked about, uh, including, as you mentioned, around transparency, which is so important? This is such an important topic. And you're in the crucible of all where all these conversations are starting in D.C. I posed a similar question to Merva. I, I said, somewhat cynically, doesn't relying on the federal government to regulate AI equate to giving big tech a 10-year free pass on essentially self-regulating? We're asking them to grade their own homework for a decade. Yeah. <laughs> because because we, we know that realistically, while the 
six, I think it's six pillars of the proposed blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. It sounds great, and it makes for good stump speeches. It's not going to get implemented in a way that will affect big tech, Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and all these companies that control your data. They are absolutely fiddling while Rome's burning. And I think we need a solution that's going to be more effective. And I think it requires some kind of a, uh, you know, a private body where big tech has to send representatives as well as ethical institutions and other other organizations that have humanity's best interest at heart and not just a profit motive. But I think there's a quicker path than relying on the AI bill of rights to work its way through Congress. And I, I think we certainly, you know, thinking of how far society has evolved since, oh, November, when chat GPT was introduced till now, just imagine the, you know, the, the pace of innovation and how many people could be harmed if we don't, you know, really get serious about reining in some of this um, innovation, which is great for a number of ways, but it's also dangerous if we don't provide the right guardrails. So as that, as those conversations are being had, Dan, I wonder whether it is possible. So here is what I'm wondering about in that uh, uh, Yuval Harari, who is very scared and skeptical of where all of this is going, with uh, AI was mentioning something very interesting in that, first of all, AI is able to process so much data that no human can. And the decision is not based on a single data point. So I will refer to something in chess. A few months back, a grandmaster in chess was beat by a 19-year-old and the reason everyone said something is wrong here is because they said no human would have ever made this move. So the move was beyond what any human could have made. They looked into it and there are allegations of uh, use of AI or outside uh, assistance in, in winning that. And what uh, Har Harari was saying is that AI is processing thousands or tens of thousands of data points, for example, for those mortgage applications. So it is not that this one data point contributed to Dan's being accepted and Mahan's being rejected. It is shades of tiny bit of this and tiny bit of that and a lot of this and a lot of that. Therefore, it makes transparency almost impossible when data has made the decision. So how are we supposed to think about it and not just go on the other end of it and say, I accept the AI must have come up with the right answer. How can you have transparency when there are so many data points being considered? There's a fascinating episode of AI in the Future of Work with a gentleman named Krishna Gade, who's the CEO of a company called Fiddler. And all that Fiddler does is practices explainability in AI. And I learned a lot from hanging out with Krishna about what it takes to be able to unpack a decision made by AI. These are phenomenally, as, as you mentioned, I mean, sometimes these neural nets are, you know, millions or tens of millions of layers deep. And so to really understand the, the components and the training process and the weights, the, we call them hyperparameters and the algorithms, it's certainly not a task suited for humans. But Fiddler is actually a, a, a platform that what Krishna says, use the word perturbs. You introduce small um, perturbations or you, know, you introduce some uh, nuances into a model when, when it's making a decision and see how the model responds in incrementally in response to these uh, perturbations. And I don't know if that's the ultimate approach or not, but just having the conversation about not settling for, you know what, it's magic. Yeah. And we, <laughs> you know, we stirred the pot, the, the, you know, and the cauldron and it started to bubble and whatever, we're going to taste whatever comes out of it. That's a really dangerously naive approach. <laughs> so whether it's Fiddler or other approaches, I, I, I mentioned, you know, three principles of responsible AI. The middle one is predictability. And part of predictability is, agreeing before we just, you know, 
bless these AI models and send them off into the wild is requiring that there's some way to introspect the decisions to, to verify the integrity of the algorithm, the integrity of the data, answer questions like what could go wrong. I use the example on my pack podcast. I think that every vendor that uses AI, which is every vendor of any technology product increasingly, should have their algorithms scored like we score the hygiene of a restaurant. I know that I don't particularly want to take my kids to the restaurant whose kitchen got a B or a C because there are probably roaches in the kitchen or something that I really don't want to have my kids exposed to. Well, similarly, I don't want my kids exposed to the equivalent of you know, a roach motel because the vendor doesn't pay attention to the principles of responsible AI. I think that's the kind of framework and insistence upon you know, in, in enforcing discipline that we need to have. And I, I think we don't, we don't have the benefit of three, four or five years. That has to be a 2023 objective. That's an outstanding perspective, Dan, in that uh, I love the analogy. You don't necessarily assume that because it's a restaurant, it's going to provide you safe, healthy, good food. Because it's AI doesn't mean that there is the transparency and the organization has done what it needs to do to make sure those biases are accounted for or eliminated. Because what ends up happening on the other end of it, a lot of times as humans, we tend to believe that the technology or the AI is right, regardless of what process it has gone through. A little while back, there was an incident with an African-American man who was arrested based on facial recognition. The cops didn't question it because the AI had flagged him as the suspect. Even though there was a 40 pound difference between him and the actual suspect. So that's why we need to question the AI. And what you're saying makes perfect sense in that we need to come up with ways of measuring and making sure that whether it's the vendor or the AI system that is being used is one that meets and exceeds the standards, not just it's magic trust us, it's going to give you good results. One of the things that I encourage everyone to understand about whether it's chat GPT or any other AI-based system is it's essentially really good at pattern matching at scale. So there's such a phenomenal amount of content that was fed chat GPT that it learned on. And this is based on a 2021 version of the internet purchased through a system called the Common Crawl. And it essentially mashes up stuff that it's ingested or it, based on things that it read out there on the internet. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't believe everything that I read on the public <laughs> internet. And so we should not be surprised when chat GPT authoritatively generates nonsense because there's a lot of nonsense that was on the web in 2021. <laughs> what chat GPT does really, really well is predict the next word based on a sequence of words. And when we see it, like, you know, in the example you gave on your June 3rd, sorry, January 3rd podcast about, you know, help me schedule the launch of a startup, you could kind of take a leap of faith and, and imagine if it's seen a billion examples of startup launch plans, it could put one together. It's pretty credible based on the parameters you gave it. Is it magic? It kind of seems like it. But when you actually unpack what it's doing and how it's doing, you you get a sense of, I don't necessarily want to rely on it for everything. <laughs> there are certain, it shouldn't be my therapist, right? Uh, you know, I, life and death decisions, I don't want made by a system that's that fallible. <laughs> but I think it's important just to remember what, what it actually is and what it does and why it's okay to be amazed by it because it is amazing technology, but it's not a panacea. Yeah, and it's important as uh, we talked about these uh, public policy issues, which are important to address, the caution that everyone needs to keep in mind when talking about AI. That said, I have also been amazed at the many tools available to organizations to implement AI effectively. 
to better understand their data, take advantage of the information that is inside the organization as you are doing in people rain, making the interactions much better, easier for HR or IT needs of organizations. So what I would love to know, Dan, is your thoughts and perspectives on what are the types of functions within organizations that lend themselves most credibly to use of AI at this point? So if you're leading a team or an organization, where would you look at strategically, say we need to focus on use of AI with respect to this part of our business? So another recent guest named Eric Olson was on the podcast, on my, my podcast recently, and here's, he's the CEO of a company called Consensus. And I love what Consensus is doing because I think this is a good blueprint for you know, the answer to your question, where is it appropriate versus where is it it's not. So what Consensus does is aggregates scientific uh, journals, uh, billions and billions of pages of research published online in scientific journals. And you ask it a question, maybe it's an ethical question, or maybe it's a question about drug efficacy, or, you know, is, is, uh, is vitamin D good for me? Or what, you know, things where there's, they're differing opinions and, and credible researchers have different opinions and they're well-researched and well-published. And what consensus does is it goes out and using generative AI summarizes the pros and cons. So when I frequently talk about AI being augmented intelligence, not artificial, there's nothing really artificial about it. It's, it's very clear what it does. <laughs> And it, it's not fake intelligence. It's really good at augmenting the intelligence of humans. And so in a case like, you know, to answer your question, consensus is a great example of where I, I as one person, I, I can't possibly, you know, plumb the depths of everything ever published about, you know, vitamin D on the internet. But wouldn't it be great if I could ask, you know, the equivalent of a chat GPT in a consensus search engine, hey, just summarize what do I need to know about whether or not I should be encouraging my kids to take, you know, a vitamin D supplement? And it comes back and it says five pros, five cons, scientifically, you know, verified, validated, you know, first class scientific journals. That's an example to me of, you know, if you extrapolate that out to education and public policy and healthcare and criminal prosecution of where I, I would strongly trust summarization algorithms or suggestions where there's always a human in the loop there's always a human at the steering wheel there's always a human you know pressing the button but ai is being used to accelerate or augment the intelligence i think that's where we should think about the best use of this technology moving forward and as we are doing that so uh Organizations are sitting on reams of internal data as well. Uh, what are best use examples uh, of accessing internal organization data for similar types of insights, not necessarily the internet? I'll give you an example from people, Rain. So uh, McDonald's has 2 million employees that ask tens of thousands of questions a day. Uh, when am I going to get my tax forms? I need to update my profile. What's the, what's our reimbursement policy, uh, you know, for, for home office equipment? What, uh, you know, what's our policy on maternity leave? Uh, you know, can I, can I upgrade to the latest iPhone? And if so, when, I mean, just things that come up in the ordinary course of business and a great use of AI is being able to go and, summarize or answer these questions that come up routinely. But in the old way of doing work, if I as an employee at McDonald's call the help desk, and I think that, you know, some all knowing being is going to answer the phone and just be sitting there waiting for me to ask a question that that person has never heard before, and that they're going to magically provide the right answer, it's unrealistic. And that's what leads to ironically, a very dehumanizing experience. Because the person on the other end of the phone does exactly what they've been trained to do. They say, I'm going to 
submit a ticket on your behalf and I'll let you know when I have an answer and they're going to go off and spend some time researching it. Well, wouldn't a better way be if I could just ask the question to a virtual agent that knows everything about every question that's ever been asked about an iPhone or about benefits or about anything and using natural language in real time, I get the answer in my language of choice. Like that's using the power of data and the power of algorithms to make a human life better. And I mean, granted, I'm quite biased because that's what people rain does. But the reason why we started people rain is because that problem exists at scale. So I, I think that whenever there's a question that can be answered with data and whenever something can be predicted or learned from data, but augmented by empathy and rational thinking and all the things that that uh, you know exaggerate or or require the best of our humanness to me that's where the where we should be investing in better use of the technology and certainly in corporate settings i think we're you know less than 12 months away from where that will be the experience that employees expect because when we use netflix and we get great recommendations or personalized experiences on amazon you know what? We, it no longer seems like science fiction. We expect that experience. When we go to return a package on Amazon, you don't say, hey, you know what? I need to submit a trouble ticket to the Amazon help desk, right? <laughs> Nobody says that's that's the way to get my problem solved, right? You just go online and you, you, know, you fill out the form and the package magically gets returned. Well, we're taking those sensibilities with us into work. And so the fact that the capabilities to deliver, you know, a, a, a high touch, very human process to deliver better employee experience, the technology is there. It, it, it's essential that we demonstrate that we value and respect and trust employees by giving them the experience that they're already getting as consumers outside work. Oh, I love that, Dan. And uh, what you've mentioned a couple of times is reducing that friction, which then both makes the work more rewarding and easier for people and gives them that time back. You uh, mentioned the Amazon example, and I had a conversation with John Rossman has written a series of books on the Amazon way. He had launched Amazon Marketplace and he talks about innovation at Amazon. And part of the what he talked about is the fact that what people see as truly transformative innovation is really slight reduction of friction and he used the example of the returning something back to amazon including the fact that uh, first you had to fill out a lot of things then you had to put it in a box then now when i have to return it my daughter wanted to return a shirt i just go to ups and drop it off so it's reducing that friction that AI allows for the organization to do. Now, on the individual professional level, how do you see professionals and individuals needing to reinvent themselves to learn, not necessarily to become AI experts or start businesses, but to be able to augment themselves in this future of work? Great topic. I'm glad you brought that up, Mahan. A guest on the show named Kamal Alawalia is the president of a company called Eightfold, which is a talent management platform that uses AI to figure out whether it's horizontal uh, uh, or lateral movement within an organization or vertical movement, how to solve the upskilling and reskilling problem. Oftentimes, the best talent to fill an open role is within the four walls of a company, but it's really hard to identify it if you come from, let's say, a non-traditional background. And if you know that uh, calcified degree on the wall says, I don't know, you're an accountant, you're not going to likely be the marketing team's first choice. And yet, perhaps you have skills. Uh, you're a creative writer. You have a blog. You are a youth sports coach. Some other attributes that tend to correlate well with people who excel in marketing, wouldn't it be nice if as an organization, you could use AI to figure out who are the best people? Where's my talent 
that could best fill these roles. It costs twice as much to fill a vacant role as it does to invest in an, in an existing employee to prevent them to, from leaving the organization. So just knowing that alone, approaches to talent management that use AI to build a skills profile, as opposed to looking at a resume, to me, that's the, that's the future of work. And uh, more and more, I'm seeing organizations invest in that uh, kind of a, uh, a more progressive view of talent and how they manage it. And I think that's, uh, that's, you know, that, that's the vision I hope more companies start to embrace when it comes to the dire need to reskill and upskill it's going to be you know, very real in the next 10 years. I love that, Dan, because it's really cr- taking the creativity of taking this tool and applying it to a resource we have that we are not tapping into now. So it opens up new opportunities and new potentials, whether within the organization or outside. So AI has lots of different potentials. Now, you have been very generous with your time. As I said, I can go on for hours with you. And you do have an outstanding podcast that the listeners need to listen to to get a better sense. You mentioned some of the conversations. By the way, one of the ones I also loved was with Dave Kellogg. And I loved his explanation of value creation versus value extraction and the challenge that Google has. So that's one the listeners should definitely listen to as well. In addition to your podcast, Dan, are there resources or practices that you recommend for executives and leaders, business leaders in organizations so they can better understand AI and its application to the organization's strategy and tactically within the organization? You mentioned Yuval Harari. Uh, Homo Deus is a, a bit of a dystopian read, but <laughs> there are a lot of interesting ideas and, and a lot of what I espouse, you know, thinking about the future of work can be tied back or actually are consistent with some of those principles. Uh, another great guest on my show, I'd encourage uh, your listeners to read up on. Uh, his name is Dr. Mark von Riesmanam. And uh, he is a futurist and an author and does a lot of interesting thinking about some of these principles. Another one, you actually mentioned Gary Bowles is a friend. He's been on on my podcast twice. And uh, I consider him a real progressive thinker and a visionary. When He's actually the chair of the Future of Work track at Singularity University. So yeah, another person I I think who generates, he's actually, uh, he publishes a lot of his work in the form of LinkedIn learning courses. So I encourage everyone to go out and get to know Gary and some of the way he thinks about the stuff. Uh, that's a starting point, but so many great thinkers out there. Oh, I'll mention one other. Uh, this is kind of a preview of coming attractions. I just recorded an episode with a professor at NYU named Meredith Broussard, who is uh, about to publish a very interesting book on the ethics of AI called More Than a Glitch. And we're taping this in January of 2023. Her episode probably won't get published until around the first week of February, but Meredith Broussard is a name to a, a name for your listeners to keep in mind. She has a, a, a previous book called Human Unintelligence, and then following it up with uh, More Than a Glitch. But a few thinkers, a few few leaders who I, I would encourage your, your listeners to follow. Outstanding recommendations. And Gary's son lives in D.C., so whenever he's in town, I get a chance to corner him and have conversations. I love his thinking as well. Now, Dan, in addition to all the AI work, all the entrepreneurship, you seem to be an adrenaline junkie and a triathlete. So what is it that makes you an adrenaline junkie in addition to all the training that you have to do for the triathlon? (laughs) Mahan, guilty as charged. (laughs) Uh, I find that a lot of the the, the energy that fuels my my passion for entrepreneurship, my passion for AI, my, my passion for the podcast, things like that. It's the same desire to find your limits, test your limits, exceed them. To me, that's a way to celebrate our humanness, our humanity, is by going right to the edge of what you're capable of and discovering that you're capable of more than you thought you were. And so whether that's finishing a triathlon after, before you start training, saying there's absolutely no way 
this human can finish a triathlon and then doing it. Or, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, scuba diving in a, in a, in a foreign place or in a, in a, in a setting that takes you out of your comfort zone, jumping out of a plane. You know, these are all things that a different version of yourself may, may say, that's something that other people can accomplish, but I never could. And then to go and train for it and prepare your mind and prepare your body and accomplish something that you didn't think you could do. There's no greater celebration of your humanness than to do something like that, whether it's work, play, family, uh, that that's life. And, uh, you know, to me, that's uh, it, it doesn't get in any better than than really always feeling like you're pushing your limits and living life to the fullest. You are doing a great job with that, as well as I love the focus that you have for your organization in making lives better for the people that you serve in the organizations that you work with. I also love uh, in one of your LinkedIn posts, you had quoted your muse, uh, the man in the purple velvet jumpsuit. And you said that he said it best, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to celebrate this thing called life. Dan Turchin, thank you so much for helping us celebrate life and use tools such as AI to live richer and more fulfilling lives. Thank you so much for this conversation, Dan. Such a pleasure, Mahan. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for having me.